Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we've got this really sweet old Omega Seamaster. This has an automatic movement. It's from the 50s. And as you can see, the, well, it's in rough shape overall, but the dial has this really cool patina on it where it's, I don't know, probably got wet at some point and it's turned into this kind of golden creamy color that's really sweet. And I kind of have an idea for this watch that I'd like to try to restore it so that the crystal and the case and everything else looks really nice and shiny and new, but the dial still looks really like that. <laughs> that really cool old school look with that neat pattern on it. So that's what I'm gonna do. I bought this watch off of eBay. It was listed as not running well, now let's find out. Let's put it on the uh, time grapher here and see how it does. Ooh. Ooh, it is not running well. Wow, they were not kidding about that. Minus 312 seconds per day is the rate. That's really bad. The amplitude is 155 degrees, which is very low. We had hoped that to be well up into the 200s for a watch of this age. So we've got some work to do to get this thing running. And of course, that is gonna be our primary concern is making sure that it runs correctly. And then we'll take a look at the aesthetic aspects as well as we dive in. Ooh, yikes. Okay, well, taking a quick look at the movement here, we can see that this is a really uh, aesthetically pleasing movement from Omega. This is a bumper automatic movement. This is what they did before. They had the free spinning rotors that you'll see in some of the other automatic movements. And the, the basic premise is that that rotor uh, slides back and forth as you move your hand around, and every time it does that, it winds up the watch just a little tiny bit. And uh, that way you don't have to wind it every day. As long as you wear it regularly, it'll keep going. But as we know, while the watch is running, it is really not running well, and uh, we're gonna have to do at least a service on this watch to try to figure out why that amplitude is so low. Amplitude is, um, think of it kind of like the horsepower of the watch. Uh, it's how much power is making it down to the uh, to the balance wheel, and that's the part of the watch, you know, that regulates time. So that it's another way to say how healthy the watch is running, how much power is getting through. So we need to get that amplitude up. 150 degrees isn't going to do it. Taking a quick look at the watch out of the case, and yeah, look at that patina. I I'm really curious what happened to this watch to give it that look, but I'm telling you one thing right now: I am not touching that dial. I think it looks really cool. And I want that to come out in the final form. I just want to kind of clean up everything around it to sort of showcase that dial. At least that's my goal. So we'll start off by taking off the hands. You can see that this watch has a seconds hand that's not central. And this was one of the ways that they did this uh, before they kind of figured out how to easily put the watch hands in the center of the dial. And it's kind of an aesthetic choice. It, it makes the watch look older uh, as basically all watches were made this way for a very long time. Kind of gives a little more of a vintage feel maybe. You can see I've got this special box that holds the hands. It actually has like a plastic membrane inside that kind of suspends them in there just for safekeeping. Okay, so let's get into this movement and start disassembling it. Now, we've got a couple of challenges ahead of us. Um, the first thing is just that this has kind of a weird, you know, bumper automatic system. And I haven't worked on this movement before, which is usually the case when I'm working on a watch here for the channel. So not a huge deal there, but it does mean we have to figure out how this bumper automatic movement transfers the movement of that bumper rotor that slides back and forth right there. You can see it has a big weight on the bottom to help it move back and forth easier. How it transfers that power to uh, winding the watch. As you can see, the watch is running, and that means that there's some at least some amount of power in the mainspring, and with that, that means that we need to, to let down the mainspring. Now, we should be able to take off the rest of these automatic works like that. And basically, we've just turned the watch into a manual wind watch. But if I move this click out of the way, I can allow the mainspring to, to slowly unwind. 
and eventually the watch will will stop on its own. It looks like it still has a little bit of juice left in it, but as long as it isn't going to do the thing where it kind of snaps to a close, I'm fine with that. As usual, we'll start by taking off the balance assembly. This has the balance spring in it. Some people call it the hair spring as well. And uh, that's really one of the most delicate parts of the watch. So it's, it's worth it to get it out of the way early just to reduce the chance of damage. Now we can take the dial off of the watch. Like I said, that dial is kind of the superstar of this watch. It's so cool. So we'll put that in, in a dial holder for safekeeping. This kind of does a similar thing to what the hands holder does. It sort of suspends the dial in there just so, again, it, it just doesn't get dinged or damaged while it's sitting around waiting to be reinstalled. Now we can take off the hour wheel and then the cannon pinion. I've got that cannon pinion removal tool. Really does a great job with just taking those off straight away in a, in a safe way as well. I don't want to bend the part that it's attached to. Just the center wheel, by the way. And now we can very carefully take off this bumper assembly. Those springs you see at the bottom there, th those are what the bumper can hit up against and not <laughs> just be slamming against another piece of metal over and over again. And so they put springs in there so that it kind of sends it back the other direction to help it wind. And continuing the disassembly, we can go for the crown wheel here, which has very, very small screws holding it in place. It's quite difficult to get in here. There we go. Yeah, those are very tight, especially for how small of a screw it was. And then this part comes off as a two piece. And now we can take off the ratchet wheel. Yeah, a little sticky, but it comes straight up. Okay, continuing the disassembly, the click can now come off. This is held on by a screw, and then there's a spring underneath that provides tension for it to rub up against the ratchet wheel. And that spring comes out pretty easily here with the aid of a plastic stick so it doesn't go jumping off on us. And now I can start to look at taking off the uh, barrel bridge. As you can see, it's three screws that hold down the barrel bridge. That part really does need to be held on firmly because it provides kind of the structure for the barrel and all of the winding. There we go. And we can continue to take off the barrel bridge here. Well, it looks pretty dirty. Definitely going to need some good cleaning there. And now I can remove the winding stem and part of the keyless works as well. Like that. I should be able to get the... Th there we go. I should be able to get that barrel out of there now. It comes out easily. And then I can finally take off this, uh, this kind of automatic spring bumper holder thing. And you can see there's the springs underneath that again, kind of send that bumper rotor back the other direction. Really clever design to be able to uh, come up with a way for a watch to wind itself, right? 
It's like it ha- there has to be power, right? There, there needs to be some amount of energy to do that. And the people that thought of this thought, well, people wear watches. They don't sit on a desk by themselves. And so there's plenty of power kind of floating around just by the fact that human beings move their arms around, which is kind of an ingenious way to look at it. And then they figured out a way to take that power, that movement of the arm, and turn that into a winding. It's, <laughs> it's incredible, honestly, that they figured this out. Okay, it looks like the center wheel wants to come off with the train wheel bridge. Yeah, it's just stuck in there. So <laughs> usually is an indicator of dried on oil. And that's what I'm going to assume here. But it's pretty obvious that this watch needs a service badly. It's just very dirty. Running slow and poorly. Kind of a lot of indicators there. We'll hope that that's the extent of the uh, issue. Can take off the uh, pallet bridge and the pallet fork now. And as you can see, we're most way, most of the way through taking this movement apart already. And there comes out that bridge, and then the pallet fork is the last piece on this side. But there is the other side of the movement to address here as well that has the keyless works. Oh, this is a stubborn one too. There we go. Boy, this thing feels like it hasn't been serviced in a while. This is the setting lever spring, but it also acts as a cover plate for some of the other parts of the keyless work, so it's kind of a dual role. Part. So we'll take that out. We can take the minute wheel out. And then once again, we do have to be careful here with the yoke. That yoke spring there is actually, uh, where'd it go? Oh God. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I was just going to say that yoke spring can fly away on you. And uh, that's exactly what happened, but it just sort of bounced over to my desk. Now, sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it bounces away and you have no idea where it's at. And then you're in for a little bit of uh, flashlight and magnet time on the ground to try to find the dang thing. I'm working in my office. My com like, This is just my computer desk that I do these restorations at. So yeah, if it goes flying, <laughs> it can be a while. Okay, let's put the balance back on before we get the watch ready for the watch cleaning machine, mainly just to protect it. If it's in situ, as they say, if, it, if it's attached to the main plate, then it really can't get damaged. Like there's no room for parts to get in there or anything like that. We don't set it next to other parts like screws or wheels or anything either. And I always like to just use a little bit of air just to make sure that it's spinning freely. That lets me know that it's mounted properly back on the plate and then I can tighten down the bridge that holds it in place. Now we need to take apart the mainspring barrel here as well. This has the mainspring and as well as the arbor inside of it. I kind of expect this to be pretty dirty and it does not disappoint. Yes, that is pretty dirty, <laughs> confirmed. Okay, now we can remove the main spring itself. The only real way to do this is by hand. When we put the main spring back in, we'll use a special tool to do so that keeps it flat and concentric. But for removing it, it's, it's gotta come out. So better to do it gently by hand. And there's the spring there. Now we still need to take apart the rest of the automatic works. Those are the parts that I put, to, put back in the uh, in my holder a little while ago. And as you can see, the rotor and the part below it are held together by three screws. I, after taking it apart, I don't really think I actually needed to take this apart. There's no friction or moving parts between the two. It's probably just to make it replaceable, but fair enough. This one does seem to have some friction slash moving parts together though that will probably require some lubrication. 
So I'm going to go ahead and take this apart, even though it's just these absolutely tiny screws. It really makes you wonder how they made these, right? I mean, they, they made screws of this size going back to the 1800s. <laughs> they are just so small. It's really kind of an incredible engineering feat. Makes you appreciate these little watches. Okay, well, that came apart reasonably. And now we can put everything into the, uh, into the cleaning basket so that we can do the watch cleaning machine. So all the stuff needs to go in the baskets here. Everything that's going to be through the, the watch cleaning machine has to be in either one of these tiny baskets or in some section of the bigger basket that kind of holds everything. And then that whole basket there will all get submerged into the cleaning fluids and go through each of the cycles for the watch cleaning machine. And as you can see, there's everything. Yeah, even the mainspring's gonna go in. And this mainspring seems to be in fine shape, planning on reusing it. Okay, now before we put that in the cleaning machine though, let's take a quick look at the case and see what we're looking at. First things first, this crystal's done for. So we're gonna replace that for sure. And how does the case look? Uh, this is a little tough. At first I thought it might be plated, but I actually don't think it is. I think it's just got some deep pitting on it. You can see there's some staining and some dirt as well. This is gonna be tough. I might be able to, to bring this back to life at least somewhat, but the problem is that there's a couple of things. One, there's this pitting, which means that you ha you'd have to polish it down to that pit level, which can take away too much material. And I don't wanna do that. It could make it not work as well. And two, it looks like there's supposed to be a bezel on the outside of the watch. And there doesn't seem to be, it, it seems to be missing. I don't think I'm gonna be able to find one. I'll look to see if I can find, but these cases, they made a whole bunch of different variations of them. It's not like just one version. So I may just need to try to dress that up and see what it looks like without the bezel. And you can see the, there are some watchmakers uh, markings on the inside. Back in the day, watchmakers would scratch initials or codes inside to say who worked on it and when. So this watch has been serviced in its lifetime. It's just been a really long time since it's an old watch. Okay, and it goes into the watch cleaning machine. And while we're here and getting set up for this, I wanna mention I do have a Patreon for my channel. Um, if you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to support me, you can head over to patreon.com slash wristwatchrevival. And uh, you get a thank you card with a sticker in the mail. And uh, you get some cool bonuses too. You can see the videos a little early stuff like that. I really, I want to say thank you to everybody over there and especially to Zach, Trevor, Eclectic, uh, Steven Spencer, S-Man, Santa, Ross, Robert, Ray, Ralph, Nico, NT, Mitchell, Michael, Mikey, Mark, Marcus, Luke, Lee, Kyle, Kim, Kevin, Kevin, Jim, Jeff, Jason, Jason, James, Jack, Hammond, Jerry, Garrett, George, Franklin, uh, Evan, Erica, Dustin, Drew, Dr., uh, David, Cosmo, Corey, Colin, Chris, Chris, Chiseled, Brinton, Brian, Brian, Brett, Brett, Brander, Brad, Bola, Anthony, and Sophie, Andrew, Alex, and Adrian. Thank you so much for your support over there. I really do appreciate it. And with that, the watch is clean. If you've ever wanted to see what an entire watch looks like, <laughs> all taken apart, nice and shiny now, this is it. Every little part. It's going to go back into this watch and when we reassemble it is laid out here in front of your eyes. Isn't it nice? Won't stay that way for long because we got work to do here. First things first, let's get the, uh, let's get the mainspring back into the barrel. I'm going to use a little bit of Mobius 8200. This is a special grease just for mainsprings. I'm going to take a little bit on my finger cots and yeah, I know those are kind of funny. Uh, the reason why we don't wear gloves and we wear these finger cots instead is there's a couple of reasons. One, they're just more comfortable. They let you move your hands around more freely. 
uh, for precise work like this. Two, they're just less wasteful, right? Like you don't need to wear an entire glove every single time you work. So you're using a little bit less material. And three, they're just industry standard. They're just kind of what everybody uses for this stuff. So anyway, I put a little bit of that grease on there and then rub it along the length of that mainspring just to put a protective layer. And now I'm gonna use my mainspring winders to, uh, to safely put the mainspring back into the barrel, again, all in one kind of hit, right? You can do this by hand, but it's it's usually destructive to the mainspring and it's almost impossible not to at least dirty it. Use a little bit of Rotico just to clean up any of the extra grease. And now, oh yeah, you know it's coming. Oh, that's just one of the best sounds in watchmaking. This hobby has a whole bunch of cool stuff going on, but that has to be one of the best feelings when that mainspring clicks back into place like that. Okay, so now we can put the barrel arbor in and I'm gonna put a little tiny bit of grease or of oil, excuse me, on the top just because it does interact with that lid there and I just wanna make sure that it can spin freely. And we can start the uh, reconstruction here of the actual movement itself. First, we'll start with the train of wheels. So this is the escape wheel going into place. And yeah, this looks like the fourth wheel. Yeah, because it has that extended pivot. One thing that's kind of interesting is there's a long pivot on the bottom of this wheel that I'm actually having kind of a hard time placing. There we go. And that long pivot sticks out the other side of the movement and all the way through out the other side of the dial. And that's actually what you put the seconds hand on because that wheel happens to go around one time every minute. And so if you put a second sand on it and put 60 seconds around it, <laughs> you've got yourself a second sand. How cool is that? You're actually putting the hand directly onto that wheel. It's just the other post that sticks out the other side. Okay, so with the mainspring, excuse me, the mainspring barrel in place and the third wheel and the center wheel, now we can attempt to put on the train wheel bridge. And this is always a tricky operation as you can see each of those wheels, yeah, that didn't work. So I immediately knocked out the uh, the escape wheel. So that means I have to kind of start over again here, get that reseated, make sure the other ones are, because when you put that uh, plate on the top, the, the bridge on the top, it can very easily knock out any one of those pivots and it either can come out the top or not be engaged in the bottom. And if any of those happen, then it won't seat correctly and you can't tighten it down. So it, it is an exercise in patience. And as you can see, I'm gonna use this red stick to help me just apply a little bit of extra pressure to the plate. You don't wanna to push too hard because you can bend a pivot, but there we go, starting to get there. And I'm just gently moving around the wheels underneath to hopefully maneuver the pivots just a little bit so that they'll fall into place in their jewel holes or in the bridge. And yeah, this isn't working. Okay, <sighs> take a deep breath. And as you can see, in this case, that third wheel has come out of its pivot. And so I need to relocate that, make sure each of these is seated correctly, and then try it again. And this is just how it goes sometimes. I mean, if you look, we are trying to line up four pivots on the top there all at once. So it's kind of a lot to ask. But if you're patient with it, it will eventually seat. You just have to, kind of, oh, there we go, just like that. Did you see how it went down? That's what we wanted to see. And now if I move the wheels, ah, uh, yes, the uh, wheel, all of the wheels then in conjunction turn. So finally we've gotten it. And sometimes it just takes a while, that's just how it is. Now we can screw down the train wheel bridge. And again, just a gentle check to make sure that all the wheels are spinning freely before we continue with the rebuild, and they are. So now I can put on the barrel bridge again. So far, so good. 
Everything seems to be kind of happily going back into place. All right, and now we can screw down the barrel bridge and give it yet another test. Looking good. Can proceed with the click and the click spring. This is the type of spring that when it jumps away on you, you're in big trouble because it's so small and so light that, you know, it can, it can go on a piece of clothing and get snagged. It can go into your hair and you can't feel it. And if you, God forbid, have carpet where you're working, which I happen to, you, you are in big trouble. So you gotta be really careful with it. Now we can put on the uh, ratchet wheel back on top. And secure it into place. Like so. And I'm going to put a little bit of oil here on the surface where the crown wheel actually interacts. And I just have to line up these <laughs> kind of absurdly small screws. Look how tiny. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's funny. This is a medium small movement I would call it you know it's dwarfed by something like a pocket watch but it isn't quite as small as some of the like ladies watches that we've worked on the movement those old movements but uh alas on we go so now I can I don't really know how to put these springs back in I think I just kind of jam them in there yeah that looks like it worked you can see somebody kind of carve something into the into the uh, bridge there. I I don't like it when people do that. I mean, you you know, your goal is to try to leave as few markings as possible. I mean, to be honest, like it's kind of impossible, but like you're doing it on purpose when you're actually carving numbers or names or arrows or things like that into it. I don't think that's really great. Okay. Somehow more tiny screws to hold this bridge in place. I have to get really close to these to get them down because they're so small. Okay, now we can once again just give this a quick... Hmm. That doesn't look right. Do you see how much that barrel is moving back and forth? That is supposed to be flat. Uh, we need to investigate this. That that did not feel right to me. I was just testing to make sure that everything was lined up, but that barrel was rocking back and forth more than you would hope. So let's take off that and take a look at the, oh no. Yeah, this is a big problem. So do you see that hole? Check this out. I'll put it on the microscope so you can see. This is what they call side shake. And you're, you're supposed to test the side shake on things like this. This is way too much. There should not be that big gap. Also, you can see that the hole has become kind of elongated. It's almost like, yeah, and that, that shouldn't happen. See, when I move it, do you see how the barrel uh, lid can actually hit that wheel there? That means that there's way too much play. So we're going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to try to fix it. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. You should have a watchmaker's lathe, bore out the hole, trim down a piece of brass and press it into place, but I don't have that. And I've watched um, our friends over at the Chrono Glide channel. There's a guy named Kale there who does really great tutorials on watchmaking. And he showed a video series once where he showed a way that you can uh, repair this type of issue using a staking set, rounded stakes that match up with each other. And what, you're, what I do here is I'm actually going to use a hammer to tap this down gently to bring that material in to close up the hole a little bit and then use a brooch. See, here we go. Oh God, this makes me really nervous though because I've never done it before. My worst case is that I'm gonna have to find a replacement part for this, but this is, um, I watched him do it on the video and I'm gonna try it myself. Then I can use a brooch to open up the hole to the right size again. 
Well, okay. So let's take a look at what I've done here. So A, will it fit over the arbor? No, it will not. So that means that I have brought the hole down in size, which is what I wanted to do. But I also kind of, I don't know, you could see that I, the hole where I tapped on it at first wasn't really lined up properly. And so it kind of dented the side. And I don't know if that's going to be structural or just it doesn't look very nice. If it doesn't look very nice, then that's fine because it's going to be covered up anyway. But if I actually manage to like structurally mess this up, then I'm going to have to just get a new part. So I'm going to take the brooch here and I'm going to gently open up that hole again until it's the correct size, which should have just a little bit of side play, a little side shake like I mentioned. So let's see if this will now fit over it. Because again, that dent that I made in the side, if it didn't affect the integrity of that inner circle, then it doesn't matter. As you can see, I have not opened the hole up quite enough, which is fine. I want to do this just a little tiny bit at a time using these brooches to just a little, you know, hundredth of a millimeter or two at a time until I can get it to fit just right where it can freely spin, but there is an excessive side shake. So let's take a look now at how it fits. Uh, actually, yeah, that is fitting. And it does look like I've made a really good circle. Although I will say this has effectively no side shake and yeah, it's not spinning freely. It does spin, but it needs a little bit more space there. So we're going to open it up again. And it looks like the hole has stayed really round and concentric. I just made an extra dent, I guess, in the area there. So eh, for a first time, I'll take it. Let's see how this looks after I open it up just a tiny bit more. There we go. Now it's spinning freely. Let's give it a quick check. That's what you want to see. See a little tiny bit of side shake is okay. It's just when you have way too much like we did before that it becomes an issue. And you know what? That can affect amplitude because that part can drag against a wheel or a bridge. And if that happens, guess what? It slows down the watch. So that might've been the reason why we had the slow amplitude that, and, and also the, uh, the fact that the watch clearly needs to be serviced. Okay. So let's just give it a quick check. And yeah, that is exactly what we want to see. So a new repair technique added to the repertoire. Now, again, there's a proper air quotes way to do this, but uh, I just don't have the tools or the expertise to do it yet. And that'll have to wait for me down the line. So let's reinstall the, uh, the wheel on the top here, the ratchet wheel, and then just give it a quick, how does it see? Look at that. No movement, just a tiny, tiny bit. Remember before how it was rocking all over the place? We fixed it. That feels really good. It's also just really cool that I learned how to do this from a fellow YouTuber, right? I mean, I've basically learned everything I know about watchmaking from other YouTubers. Um, you know, Mark Lovick from the watch repair channel here on YouTube was my inspiration for all of this stuff. And I took all of his classes. I highly recommend them. You can find them at watchfix.com. And uh, he can take you through all the basics that I went through when I was first starting as well. And I, I, like I said, I highly recommend them. And no, this isn't paid or anything. I don't get anything for it. I just really like him and his classes and he's been a big inspiration for me. And I just think it's cool, you know, that, you know, we can have a community here on YouTube that kind of inspire each other to try new things. And I mean, this, this hobby has been one of my favorite things. All right, we can continue now with the uh, keyless works here. Putting on the yoke. A little bit of medium, medium oil here for these posts, which hold these an intermediate wheel as well as the minute wheel. And once again, here's the, uh, the yoke spring born to fly <laughs> these things, but uh, looks like we got away with it this time. And now we can put in the winding stem. And make sure that everything is aligned up and working properly. There 
There's a setting lever. And there's a minute wheel. And now the keyless works are almost back together. I'm going to tighten down the setting lever spring. And just give it a quick test. Uh, yeah, it's a little, there we go. Once you see it click over, then I'll usually use this grease here right where that part clicks over. And that helps it operate just a little bit better because it is a fairly high friction part. I mean, it's meant to be difficult to pull that out. And there, after it gets a little bit of grease on it, you can see that it works much better. And that's just switching from winding to hand setting. For automatic watches, you don't need to wind them um, with the stem if you don't want, but oftentimes you wanna give it a little wind if you haven't worn it for a while. Here, I'm gonna use some of the medium uh, oil once again, and I'm trying to kind of get it into, there we go, trying to get it to flow in between where the barrel and the bridge meet so that they can flow freely. Once again, just trying to get us the most uh, amplitude that we can. Well, while we have it over here, let's go ahead and uh, take care of oiling the jewels as well. This is a, a process where you put our lightest viscosity oil in between the pivot of a wheel and the jewel that it sits in. It's really simple, but um, it's actually kind of a tricky thing to do because you don't want oil splashing around all over the place. Okay, with that, we can now start to put together the automatic works once again. And this is a very, very tricky part to put on. There's a tension spring on the other side that kind of holds it down, but you have to put this screw in while it's under tension. So I'm trying to hold it down with a tweezers, but they're kind of in the way. And can I get this screw? Yes. Okay. Well, I did it. And maybe it wasn't quite as tricky as I thought, but as you can see, now it's held under tension. And that just means that's a basically a way to make it so that a wheel can turn one direction, but not the other. Now I need to reassemble the, this, this component of the uh, automatic winding works. And this is once again, I mean, look at, look at the size of the screw. <laughs> Do you see how sm it is so small? <laughs> it's like baffles the mind that they were able to even manufacture these, let alone that I have to somehow get these things <laughs> together here. Really incredible feat of engineering to make something this small. Because remember, they had to make huge quantities of these and they had to all be the same. Like the quality control on these has to be identical. Like you cannot let these things slip through if they're not perfect. All right. Into place they go, finally. And now we can reinstall this part. I have no idea what this thing's called, but this is the inner, this is the part that interacts with two things. One, the crown wheel, which you can see below it, as it turns, then it turns the ratchet wheel. So that's how the watch gets wound. And then on the other side, where it, it interacts with the center piece here of this rotor. So it's really the kind of intermediate between the rotor flying around as your hand moves and that being turned into a winding action on the watch itself. So I'm gonna use a piece of Rotico to kind of create a little bit of a platform for me to get this rotor back together, just because this under part, again, I don't think I actually needed to take this apart in retrospect. These are not, that isn't a friction piece, but it is something that they probably made separate from the rotor so that you could replace that inner gear part without having to replace the entire rotor. At any rate, no harm, no foul. So we will continue with the reassembly and I have to figure out how to line all these parts up and I'm not 100% sure how to do it. So let's do a test fit here of this upper bridge that kind of holds it all together like so. Now 
and then we can roll this around and okay, well, it doesn't seem to want to go all the way over to the left. That's not right. It, it should be able to go all the way to the spring so that it can bumper back in the other direction. So I'm going to have to do some troubleshooting here. And that means taking it apart, putting it back together, taking it apart, putting it back together. Just this automatic works to kind of figure out how to line it up properly. So after doing so, let's see if we've got it sorted out now. There we go. See how it reaches all the way to that spring on the bottom? And now as it loops back around, it can reach. That's what we needed to see. That'll create the most efficient winding that you can get from a bumper movement like this. A little bit of the medium oil there on the top just to make sure that it can spin as freely as possible. And we can go in with the, uh, the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge. And uh, all right, let's see if we can get this watch running again. We're getting really close to seeing... Uh, if it'll run and then also how well it will run. I can put a wind in it manually and just give it a quick check of the pallet fork. Yep, yep, there we go. So let's put the balance in and let's see if we can get this watch running well. This is your hold your breath moment. Does it wanna run? Oh, it does want to run. It looks like it's going to kick up all on its own for us here. Oh, wait, it stopped. Okay, just a little bump and some wine. And look at that. It's off to the races again. And we've got another running watch. And by the way, I can tell just visually that the amplitude is much better than before. And uh, if that just isn't the prettiest thing you've ever seen. I don't know what is. This is why we do it. Let's take a look though at the movement now under the microscope because we also need to uh, address the capsules for the balance. And these are kind of a two piece set. So we take it off with some Rodico and I'll show you over here what we do with them. So as you can see, these two parts come across, come apart. The, the clear part is the capsule. And then the bottom part is a jewel setting. It's a brass setting with another uh, sapphire, or excuse me, a uh, ruby jewel inside of it. And what we need to do is clean these. This is extremely important part of getting the best performance out of a watch because that needs to be lubricated the most. It is under the most tension and it spins, you know, it oscillates. I shouldn't say spins. It oscillates thousands and thousands of times per hour. And, uh, that means that it needs ample lubrication. And this setup allows you to basically suspend oil right where it needs to be. So uh, you can see, I just put the oil on there and now I can put this cap on and boom, it's all ready to go. And what will happen is the oil will sit directly in the middle, which is right where the pivot goes. And if you look closely here, you can actually see the ring of oil on the inside there. You can see where that circle of oil kind of has suspended itself. And that's right where the pivot ends up being as well. So once that's all set to go, I can reset the Inca block shock setting. That's what this is. It's actually a spring. And that spring means that if your watch gets dropped, it bends rather than the parts. <laughs> and that was a ingenious invention as well that ended up being really, really important because it means that the balance staff, that part that's sticking out right there at the bottom that's spinning around doesn't get broken off nearly as much and you don't need to take your watch in for repairs nearly as often. All right, same treatment here. I'm gonna put these in, in a solvent called One Dip. It basically dissolves any dirt or oil that's left on the jewel in the jewel setting so that it can be as clean as absolutely possible before we reapply new oil and do it. And this is why watchmakers are always telling people that they should have their watches serviced because that oil that I'm gonna put on here, it will dry at some point and it will no longer serve its function. And once that happens, the watch is gonna run a lot worse and you do run the risk of, uh, of wear. Okay, there we go. That jewel setting is back together and this is just the bottom, by the way. There's one on the top and the bottom, which of course makes sense. And I can put that into place and then button it back up 
I've gotten much, much more comfortable working on these Inca block settings. They're still a little bit finicky, but when I first started doing watchmaking, I really felt like I couldn't do it. And now, I don't know, you just don't really think about it anymore. And yes, this fiber is also bothering me and I'm gonna take it out just for you. Okay, let's put this thing on the time grapher and see what kind of results we get after regulating it. <laughs> oh man, look how much better that is. Zero, minus three, minus one, 284 degrees of amplitude up from 150. And we've got ourselves a nicely running watch. I am super happy with that. We could set the movement aside and let's address this case. So what I'm gonna do with this case is I'm gonna give it the once over, I guess. I, I don't think that this case is, a, is really, I don't think it's possible to give this case a full restoration because it's just missing too much material. Like I would have to have a laser welder which can actually add material in and then you can then uh, polish or, you know, resurface it from there. But I mean, I'm a hobbyist. I don't, <clears throat> I don't have a laser welder or anything like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give it the once over with my files here. And <clears throat> basically these are sanding sticks that are rated from coarsest to finest. And if you do a good job with them, they can actually give you pretty darn good results even if it is a little slow doing it by hand. But I'm hesitant to do this um, using my Dremel tool because these, these lugs just don't have a lot left in them. They've been polished to death and they've actually got just material missing off of them. And so I wanna just go as slow and careful as I can. And it does make for kind of a long process here as you can see. But my hope is that we can get this case looking just a bit better. I mean, I, I don't have high expectations that it's gonna look brand new. Um, there's just too much pitting and, and material missing. But if we can get it looking like decently shiny and uh, you know, kind of just cleaned up a bit. I think it'll be a nice contrast for the dial. And that's really what I want. I want it to look like the rest of the watch looks nice and clean. And then the dial still has that really dark patina on it. And as you can see, getting into this groove here is quite difficult. I've kind of made a tool for myself with some peg wood and some of the sandpaper there to try to get some of that pitting and, and dark staining. It might even just be rust out of there. As I mentioned before, it is my belief that this case actually originally came with a bezel around the edge as well. Um, it looks like it was designed that way, but I don't have the bezel, so we're going to have to make do without it. Okay, put some finishing touches on this case. And you know what? It came out actually okay. Not too bad. You can see it still has some pinning on the inside and around the edges and stuff. That I don't think is gonna be able to be resolved. Again, it's just too deep, but I think it'll still serve as a nice contrast against the uh, against the patina dial. Now you can see the edge turned out nice. That part didn't actually have any pitting on it. And I polished up the back a little bit too. Again, just to take off that like heavy scratchy, not trying to get that to be perfect or anything like that. Okay, now we can replace the crystal. I've got my crystal press tool here that I use for that. And uh, this tool is invaluable if you're replacing crystals often, it makes it an absolute snap. All you do is just sort of bend the edges of the crystal down using this aluminum die on the top. And that allows you to fit the case inside. And then when you release the pressure, the crystal simply fills in the gaps on its own just from uh, expansion. And you can actually see that happen here as I release the pressure. Now the crystal's sitting firmly inside of the case. I think this is gonna go a long way to the goal that I have of making this watch, you know, kind of shine from the dial. And as you can see, brand new crystal there. Okay, final assembly to come together. We can put the hour wheel in now. If it wants to sit, there we go. And I've got a dial washer to put on here as well. The dial washer actually just makes sure that that hour hand stays uh, connected with the minute hand below because otherwise it can become disconnected and then the hands aren't in sync anymore. And we can grab the dial. As I said before, I'm not touching this dial. I'm not gonna try to clean it. I'm not doing anything to it. I love that patina look on it and I wanna maintain it. Okay. 
we can put the dial into place and now we can put the hands as well. <laughs> Got a bit of a contraption set up here to try to make a flat surface for my, <laughs> my hand press tool, but it looks like it worked. And there we go, the hour hand goes into place. Now we can put the minute hand in as well. Like that. And make sure that nothing's touching. And we've of course got the seconds hand to put on. And this is again, the other side of that fourth wheel. Pretty cool. And just make sure it's lined. There we go. And it looks like it's running along just fine. Get the case clamps in there and we can put the case back on. And it looks like we've got another finished project here. Let's see how it looks in its dressed up case at least. And look at that dial. <laughs> it is so cool showing all that wear. I also like the fact that this is a Seamaster watch and it looks like that dial's been out to sea <laughs> for, for a while. And uh, yeah, really cool little watch to wear around. As you can see, it really does carry that patina quite nicely. Let's put a watch strap on this as well. I'll probably try out a couple of different colors. It, it always uh, is kind of a feel thing. I don't think that there's really any hard and fast rules about which strap is going to look best. It's just kind of, you know, when you got it type thing, but we'll, we'll throw a strap on here just to, to take a look at it, to see kind of how it would look as a finished product. Boy, what a cool restoration. We learned some stuff along the way and ended up with a pretty cool looking little vintage watch that we got off of eBay and uh, restored up to look nice and shiny. Thank you so much for joining me for yet another restoration here. I'm really happy that you decided to, uh, to come along with me as I learn and enjoy the hobby of watchmaking. If you want to find me on social media, uh, you can find me at Instagram. It's wristwatch underscore revival. And I'll post pictures of like tools and my watches and uh, project updates and that kind of stuff over there. I'd love to say hi. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time.